It's as if the last 10 years never happened. A defiant Bashar al-Assad running for an all but guaranteed fourth seven-year term in an election labeled a sham and illegitimate by the U.S. and other countries. Running against two obscure government-sanctioned candidates, no one's expecting any surprises. After all, Assad claimed nearly 90% of the 2014 vote during a civil war that pitted his supporters against those who wanted to overthrow his regime. The international community should treat this, as I said, a non-event. It's absolutely not changing the economic conditions on the ground. It's not changing the political conditions on the ground. Syrians are just as oppressed. They will be just as oppressed on Thursday as they are today. After a decade of a war like no other the world has seen in generations, most of this broken country, with help from allies Russia and Iran, is back under Assad's control. But Syria today is a shadow of the country he inherited from his father more than 20 years ago. Syrians are facing a hunger crisis, the majority living in poverty. More than half can't afford a basic meal, according to the UN. But through it all, Assad continues to cling on. The Assad regime and its allies, they just want to continue to confirm that they will not budge an inch, despite everything the country has been through in 10 years, despite the fact that they're struggling to keep the country alive economically, they are still adamant about not changing a single thing. From Bashar al-Assad's perspective, this is an existential crisis. He will fight to the death. He said this many years ago. His supporters said this, Assad, Assad, Assad or we will burn down the country. And the country burnt, 12 million displaced, hundreds of thousands of lives lost, more than 120,000, like Ali Mustafa, vanished into the black hole of the regime's prison system. His daughter Wafa counts the days since she last saw her father. More than 2,800, that's nearly eight years. She's been fighting for his freedom and for that of others forcibly disappeared by the regime. I think of my dad, obviously, and I, I feel him every day, but now more than ever, it's just heartbreaking. My dad is probably being tortured. Luckily, if he's still alive, while Assad is being elected for another term, it makes me feel very angry, very sad, very disappointed. I'm feeling helpless, and this is the point where I ask myself, my dad, is everything I'm trying to do pointless, just pointless? Wafa describes the election as a silly play, but that doesn't make it any less painful or dangerous. This is also a message to all dictatorships and to all war criminals around the globe that yes, you can commit war crimes, you can use chemical weapons against your own people, and you can actually bomb your country and detain millions and displace them and kill them, and you can still get away with it, and you can still be elected for another okay. term, and you can still be called a president. This election, a clear message to the world. Assad has not only survived, he is here to stay. Well, Syrian officials have repeatedly denied allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity, insisting they target terrorists. Well, I want to bring in uh, Qutayba Id Ilbi. He is the special representative of the Syrian opposition coalition to the United States and a fellow at the International Center for Transitional Justice. And before we talk about these elections, I just want our viewers to get a sense of your journey. You grew up in Damascus. You were jailed and tortured twice, as I understand it, at the start of the revolution before you eventually escaped to the United States. Just, just tell us about that journey and how you got to where you are now. Thank you so much, Becky, and you know, uh, good afternoon to you, or good evening. Um, as you said, I grew up in Damascus. My family was a little bit more oriented, but in a sense, I grew up in that same prison we see um, Syrians in today. I remember when I was um, in high school, our teachers would be bused, you know, on the elections day um, to go to the election centers um, where they didn't really have, not only they were not, you know, had a choice to vote, you know, yes or no on Assad, but they were actually forced to vote with blood um, in front of security officials who were running election centers. Um, in a way, Syria was um, and still is the kingdom of silence, um, where Assad continues to push forward this badly produced 
reduced um, image of democracy um, on the literally on the blood and bodies of people that uh, he has killed throughout those 10 years of war um, today's um, Assad's today's visit to Duma where he um, casted his vote is, is a clear evidence of that where he went it, he went to the same city um, he bombed with chemical weapons um, just eight years ago um, I was, I think, among the lucky ones. Um, I survived torture twice, and then the third time I had to escape Syria um, because Assad's regime uh, decided to go after my 16 years old brother when I um, didn't deliver myself. Um, I had no option then other than leaving Syria and eventually making it to the United States. But, you know, back then, you know, living in Syria, I remember the moments of, you know, 2000 when the constitution changed um, just to fit Assad um, to take the, you know, the presidency after his father. It's exactly the same thing we see today. Um, the constitution designed in 2012 and the laws that came after really just designed this race just for Assad to move forward. Um, candidates can, you know, no candidate can, can run for presidency unless they get approval from the parliament, from 35 members from the Parliament that Assad controlled. Um, the Supreme Court in Syria, which is appointed by Assad, is the one who needs to approve any candidate. And then no Syrian so, who has been living in the country for mm. 10 years can, can run for election, um, which is again designed to push away all those Syrians who ran away from war in the past, almost half of the Syrian people who ran away from the war in the last 10 years. Well, the, the, the UN, the international community, many voices from the international community calling this election illegitimate. Um, I want our viewers and you to have a listen to what Bashar al-Assad had to say in response to those comments. Have a listen. All the statements that we heard recently from Western countries, most of which have a colonial history, that evaluated and determined the illegality of these elections, as a state, we do not care at all about such statements. But what is more important than what the state says, or does not say, is what the people say. I think that what we have seen during the past few weeks is the clear enough answer to all of those statements. And it tells them that the value of your opinions is zero, and your value at Self is 10 zeros. I can only imagine what you what your response to those to those uh, comments are. Do you envisage a Syria without Bashar al-Assad in power at all? I dream about it, Syria without Assad, to be honest. But the mo the problem is at the moment with the lack of will from the international community to push forward for a political transition in mm. Syria. It's hard to imagine this dream coming true, to be honest. Um, Assad have stayed for over 10 years, but he stayed over a destroyed country. Um, Today in Syria, we don't really, to be honest, we don't have one Syria. We have four Syrias divided between different controlling parties. My hope is that, you know, in that part of free Syria we have in, in the north, to be able to establish a secular governance model where we're able to show Syrians what was what is the Syria that we dreamt for in 2011 looks like, regardless of, you know, whether Assad maintains his control over, you know, um, half of Syria or not. I think the challenge for us especially in the political opposition is to show Syrians that this is what we have came out for in 2011 mm. and then establish that model where we can attract Syrians you know to come to those areas as kind of like an east-west Germany model today in northern Syria you know I talk to still to a lot of people in Damascus businessmen regular people and I get calls all the time people asking me how can we make it to northern Syria to find new opportunities for ourselves mm. um, even those areas that are not you know governed by you know a perfect governance model sometimes it's just um, a little bit of chaos but it still um, provides hope for all of those Syrians including those who are living under Assad today the 10-year anniversary of the Arab Spring just passed earlier this year, and it is sad to say, but Syria couldn't be in a worse place at this point. The Obama administration was heavily involved in that decade of, or the beginning of that decade of civil war. I just wonder what you hope uh, to see from Washington at this point. This is an administration which, quite frankly, has not put the Middle East front and center on its, or in its foreign file. 
Absolutely. Um, and it is worrying, to be honest, that we don't see the Middle East at the forefront of priorities. Even though the administration, you know, um, have been pushing forward human rights as a priority, um, has been pushing forward foreign policy for the middle class. Um, my message is that if we really care about human rights, um, Syria is the place to actually be engaged. If we really care about um, great power competition with China, Russia, and Iran as well, Syria is the place where we are being challenged challenged in the United States from Russia, from China, and from Iran. Um, the lack of engagement there means for all of those great powers that we're not serious about advocating human rights. We're not serious about our um, global power competition and ensuring, you know, the U.S. role around the world. And we're not, I mean, more importantly, we, we, we're not serious about the future lives of the Syrian people. Um, the main thing that the administration needs to work on is to ensure real engagement on Syria, um, which unfortunately we haven't seen so far from the current administration.